All right, welcome to our final video in this section. In this video, we are going to talk about APT, Arbitrage Pricing Theory. So I'll start off by talking about some of the problems with the CAPM that have been known for a long time. And then I'll talk about some of the anomalies that are associated with the CAPM. And then finally, I'll introduce our APT, uh, well, what, what is APT? And I'll introduce uh, one of the most prominent APT models right now. Uh, you know, let's get going. Okay, so there's a lot of big problems that we've known about with respect to the CAPM for, I mean, since it was created. Probably the most famous one is Rolls Critique. And Rolls Critique says, you know, our best proxy for the market is the S&P 500 index. But that only includes stock. It doesn't include coins or bonds or other assets. And so because we cannot perfectly uh, estimate the return on the market portfolio, then we can't ever know whether or not the CAPM works or does not work. Basically, Rolls Critique is the ultimate catch-22 in investments. Because we can't use a perfect market portfolio, we don't know whether the CAPM would actually work if we had perfect information on the market portfolio. Uh, next, historically low beta stocks have high returns or higher returns than uh, predicted, and high beta stocks have lower returns than predicted by the CAPM. Uh, this is going to lead us to our, our famous betting against beta anomaly, one of the four or five anomalies I'm going to ask you guys to uh, be very, very, very familiar with. Uh, also, uh, not everyone can borrow at the risk-free rate. If you're a creditor, if let's say you have very bad credit, you're not going to be able to borrow at close to the risk-free rate. You could always buy T-bills, but I mean, quite frankly, a lot of people are not able to borrow at the risk-free rate. Uh, also, not everyone can short. In certain markets, you're not allowed to short. Uh, there was talk right during the financial crisis about uh, suspending short trading in the U.S. Uh, in countries like China, shorting is actually not allowed. The only way you can really short uh, Chinese securities or assets in China is by shorting an ETF that tracks Chinese securities. Also, beta can be time varying. And to go along with that, uh, the CAPM and our betas that we estimate, they're based on historical data. So maybe a company changes its operations within five years. So we're relying on historical data to calculate beta, but the beta right now could be very, very different. The amount of market risk associated with the firm could be very different from what it was even a year ago. And finally, beta might not be our only measure of risk. It might not be our only factor that investors are pricing in. You know, maybe they're concerned about liquidity. Maybe they're concerned that, oh, these stocks of companies that have exercised growth prospects are a bit risky right now. And that leads me to market anomalies. There's all kinds of these issues and as soon as the CAPM was developed, we started being able to identify uh, different uh, securities with different, different characteristics that would outperform or underperform what the CAPM predicted. This is what market anomalies are. A market anomaly is just a, a case where we identify consistent realized returns that are unexplained by the CAPM or some other model. Uh, now, I, I just mentioned the betting against beta anomaly a few seconds ago. Uh, if you had me for 310, we definitely talked about the value anomaly. Uh, we also have things like the size anomaly, the momentum anomaly, the liquidity anomaly. If I go over here to Wikipedia, you can see there's a lot of other anomalies that have been identified in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, I mean, every single thing that you're looking at right now is an anomaly that's appeared in a top tier uh, academic journal demonstrating, uh, you know, an anomaly. So the net debt financing anomaly or uh, the change in taxes anomaly, the junk stock momentum anomaly. All of these are just, you know, some of these are less well known, uh, you know, something that appeared in uh, the JF in 2001 is probably very well known. But if we're talking about an anomaly that just became, was just discovered, it's probably less well known. Uh, but there we go. 
Okay, so let's get familiarized with some of the most important anomalies. The first one that I want you to be familiar with is betting against beta. And betting against beta, like I said, it indicates that if you were to plot the security market line and then put all of the securities in the market into portfolios based on their betas and then plot them, what you would see is that the securities in the portfolios with low betas actually have positive alphas. Basically, they have higher than expected returns. Whereas the betas in the high, or sorry, the, the securities in the high beta portfolio consistently underperform what the CAPM predicts they would offer in, in terms of return. Basically, for this portfolio, uh, the portfolio has a beta of, let's say, 1.8 and an expected return of, we'll say 17%, but it has an actual return of 13%. So it underperforms on average by, by quite a bit. It's alpha is very, very negative. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, so what I just showed you in the prior slide, that's from a 1972 paper by, by Black, Jensen, and Scholes. This is more recent evidence from uh, a paper in the 2010s. And even though we have, oh, an additional 40 years worth of data, this anomaly is still present. I mean, low beta stocks still have positive alphas, whereas if we go to the high beta stocks, the stocks in the, the 10th portfolio with the highest betas, they still offer slightly negative alphas. So, you know, the I think the uh, alphas have diminished, but they are still there. They are still pretty consistent. The next anomaly we have is the famous value anomaly. And the value anomaly indicates that stocks with high book to market ratios outperform stocks with low book to market ratios. Uh, this one, uh, there, are, I, I probably should say, uh, most on, most anomalies tend to dissipate once they're identified. This one has stuck around for a very long time. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that have been given for why this anomaly exists. Uh, if you want my best thought as to you know what the explanation is, I think uh, Lu Zhang had a 2005 paper where he he explained it best. Basically, firms that exercise uh, you know growth prospects, you know they they're actually building facilities or factories. Uh, those are going to be the fir the firms with the highest book to market ratio, and you know to account for the risk associated with. Uh, building these fixed assets and exercising these growth prospects, uh, that's a risk factor. And so uh, those firms should be compensated for taking on that risk. So a good example would be a physical bookstore is riskier than an online bookseller because they have more physical assets. So investors should demand greater returns uh, for holding that, uh, that stock. All right, so uh, the next anomaly we have is the famous size anomaly. This was discovered in the early 1980s by Bands, and I thought I'd show you the actual data that Bands had in his his academic paper. So this is table three from Bands 1981, and we have different, he performed just like any good academic, a, a host of, of different tests. He looked at the breakdown in uh, portfolios based on size over different time periods. And what you can see here is that if you were to put stocks into portfolios based on their size, so here he's got the uh, portfolio containing the small stocks, uh, the, so the 50 smallest stocks in some index held uh, during the year, and then shorting the largest stocks in that same index over about a 35 or 44 year period, 45 year period, the alpha is 1.01% per month. So your alpha annually for this trade, basically uh, taking a long position on small stocks and shorting large stocks would have been 12% annually. That's 12% on top of the actual returns. Basically, this is an enormous alpha. Uh, over the 70 to 75 period, we still see a pretty significant alpha, so 11.76% annually. Early on, this alpha was significantly larger, 4% per month. I mean, that's, <laughs> that is insane. Uh, but this, 
this effect has uh, dissipated to some extent as we use more and more recent data. Uh, now the next anomaly you should be familiar with is the liquidity anomaly. And the liquidity anomaly, basically, uh, when we talk about liquidity, uh, essentially we're talking about the ease and speed with which an asset can be sold at a fair market value. Uh, so if an asset is very liquid, you can sell it for what it should be worth very quickly. So shares of Apple stock are very liquid when the market is open because you can sell those shares in an in instant for relatively what they should be worth. You don't have to take a discount in order to offload those shares. Now there's something out there called the illiquidity premium and the illiquidity premium says that illiquid securities should garner higher returns than liquid securities to account for the additional risk associated with those illiquid securities. In other words, uh, basically the higher the trading costs, the greater the discount for the security and the higher the future returns on that security. Now we typically measure illiquidity using the bid ask spread or lowest asking price minus highest bid price divided by the current price of the stock. So it's basically the bid ask spread ratio. So let me show you what uh, the most famous paper on this uh, anomaly found. So this is from Amahud and Mendelssohn, 1986. Uh, what they do is they calculate the uh, bid ask spread as percentage of current price uh, for every stock and they sort stocks into seven portfolios and they calculate the monthly excess return on each of those portfolios. And what you can see is definitely a positive relationship here. The stocks with the highest bid ask spread, in other words, the most illiquid stocks had the highest excess return. So highest return in excess of the risk-free rate. Uh, the stocks with the lowest bid ask spread, had the lowest excess return. So basically what they're finding here, they're not showing alpha in this chart, but they are showing excess return. And basically the, the less liquid an asset, the higher the expected return or the higher the actual return. All right. So what I just showed you was evidence that anomalies exist. And if anomalies exist, what that says is that the cap M does not perfectly predict expected returns. These anomalous alphas indicate that risk factors other than the market risk factor uh, could predict returns. And so this is the entire concept behind APT. APT says that uh, in addition to the market risk factor, there are other risk factors that could predict stock returns. So what we can do is build a model that accounts for these different risk factors. Uh, basically, APT models, they'll very often take the cap M and they'll add to the market risk factor some additional risk factors, things like a, a value factor or a size factor or a profitability factor. Uh, and you know, this is APT models, they're they're essentially models that have a series of factors that should predict expected stock returns. And, you know, the hope here is that they offer more prediction ability than your, your garden variety cap app. Uh, so there's a couple steps that we use when we develop APT models. First, we need to identify factors. And usually what people do is identify factors that have historically predicted uh, stock returns or excess returns. So we'll usually go to a, an anomalous variable and that's going to predict stock returns. So we'll add that fact that we'll create a factor out of that variable. Next, we measure the sensitivity with respect to these factors. So we essentially, we have this in sample data set where we uh, run a regression form of the model and calculate the betas with respect to those factors. And then we use those betas to predict expected stock returns. So I, I realize this is a, definitely a bit confusing, but let me show you how we, we actually do this. So uh, what we do is we have some idea of some anomalies that predict stock returns and someone will have built some factors based on those anomalous variables. They'll run a regression using some data and calculate the beta associated with those variables. And then very often they'll provide those, those betas to everyone. So I, 
In my last video, I talked about Ken French's website. Uh, Ken French's website puts out the betas with respect to things like the uh, market risk premium and then a bunch of other factors. So like the SMB, the HML factor, uh, the five factor model. Uh, basically, if you're looking for factor betas, this is the easiest place to find those without calculating them yourself. All right, so uh, there's a lot of factor models out there. There's the Fama French three factor model, the Carhartt four factor model, all kinds of five factor models. I'm gonna show you the Fama and French five factor model just because they provide the data for it. Uh, but uh, each of these APT models, these factor models, they'll regress the excess returns on an asset on a series of factors. This first factor is typically going to be the market factor. Then we might have the size factor, the value factor. Uh, and then when we run this regression, uh, we're going to calculate the alphas and the betas. So let me just walk through a very basic one of these APT models. Uh, what you're looking at is the three factor model, the model form of that model of the three factor model and the regression form. The model form is the form that we have when we already calculated the betas. So we basically, we have some beta with respect to the market risk premium. We have a beta with respect to another factor and a beta with respect to a third factor. If we're trying to predict the return on a certain asset, like a stock, all we need to do is estimate the market risk premium and uh, the SMB factor and the HML factor. And this model will spit out the expected return on this stock or this ETF or whatever we want. Now, the model form, this is the form we use when we already have the betas. The regression form is the form that we use when we want to actually calculate those betas. Uh, so, you know, this is where we use actual regression. Now, uh, you might be wondering where we get some of these factors like the SMB factor and the, the HML factor. Uh, Fama and French, when they created the SMB factor and the HML factor, uh, they did this in a 92 paper. And what they did was they took all assets, all stocks in the market, and they broke them up into six different portfolios. So based on book to market value and market cap. And so the, uh, let's start off with the SMB factor. Uh, so they sorted all stocks based on market cap and the small stocks went into one of these three portfolios. The big stocks went into one of these pre three portfolios. To calculate the factor returns, what they did was they took the returns on the small stocks minus the returns on the big stocks, and that is how they created their SMB factor. It's basically you know the you know average return on these minus average return on these. That's how you get your factor during that month, uh, you know that monthly period. The value factor is basically our high minus low factor. Uh, they sort all stocks based on book to market ratio. Uh, smallest stocks based on book to market ratio go in these two portfolios. Uh, largest stocks based on book to market ratio go in these two portfolios. And then they just take the average return on this portfolio minus the, or sorry, these two portfolios minus the average return on these two portfolios. Uh, so that's how they get their high minus low factor. And then they use these factors and actual portfolio or stock returns to estimate the betas for every, you know for a certain time period. Now, the five-factor model adds two additional variables to that. Uh, the first is the robust minus weak uh, variable that was identified by several previous authors, and then they also have a conservative minus aggressive factor that again was identified by other researchers. So Fama and French, they basically identify that, uh, you know, they, they've, you know, other researchers have identified these anomalies. Fama and French take those anomalous variables, construct a factor, and then just add those, you know, in this case, those two additional factors to their three factor model to build a five factor model. If you're curious about those factors, feel free to click this link. You can actually see how those uh, factors are constructed. Okay, so let's use a five-factor model to determine the alpha of SMPIX, uh, the ETF that I used in the last video. 
So I'm going to move over to Excel and we're going to run a regression uh, using all five factors. Okay, so I'm over here in Excel and you might remember this data set. Uh, it's the same as our data set for the last video. Uh, what we have here is monthly data on a series of factors, say the five factors that we'll use for the uh, five factor model. Uh, and then we also have our fund returns. I selected two funds, so the SMPIX and the Russell 2000 ETF. Uh, so we have monthly return data for those. Uh, now I should describe some of this stuff. Uh, this data set goes back to about 1963, or at least the factors do. Uh, this, the fund data only goes back to about either 2000 or 2010, 2000 for the SMPIX, 2010 for the VTWO. And I've also calculated the excess returns on SMPIX and VTWO because we're going to need those when we calculate the uh, alphas. Now, uh, I should probably describe what these factors are. Each of these factors is the difference between some two variables during the period. So our market risk premium for May of 2024, this represents the amount by which the S&P 500 outperformed the risk-free rate or the t-bill yield during that month the smb factor this is the amount by which small stocks outperformed big stocks in may of 2024 the hml factor this is the amount the amount by which value stocks outperformed or in this case underperformed uh, uh growth stocks during may of 2024 and so on and so on uh, so basically that's how we construct our factors here now let's use the five factor model to calculate the alphas on SMPIX. So I'm going to scoot over here, give us some room and go over to the data tab and click on data analysis, click on regression. And from my last example, I already had this data loaded. Uh, our Y variable here, uh, I'm going to make that our SMPIX excess returns and just as in my last video, I'm going to use uh, 60 months of data or five years of monthly returns. Our X range, though, uh, it's not just going to be the market risk premium. I'm going to use five factors worth of data. So I'll use five years of monthly data for these five factors and just highlight the data I want. Uh, because I have labels highlighted, I've you know got the labels box checked, and then I've got my output range, which I'll put O oh, right here. And then if I click OK, ah, I have a difference here. Oh, uh, yeah, I need to change that from row 62 to row 61 and click OK. And now I have the regression output for my five-factor model. All right, so uh, just like in the last video, my R squared is important. Uh, my R squared in this case is a little larger than it was with the cap M. I think my cap M uh, regression had an R squared or an explanatory power of 0.63. Now it's 0.67. And down here we have our alpha and our betas with respect to every factor. So here is our alpha. And then each of these is a beta with respect to a factor. So, you know, this first one, uh, 1.955, this is our beta with respect to the cap M. And then this is our SMB beta, our HML beta, our RMW beta, and our CMA beta. So if we wanted to predict stock returns, uh, what we could do you know, I mean, we could basically plug in uh, expected factor values like uh, the our expectation for the market risk premium, uh, our expectation for SMB during the next month or the next year, uh, HML expectation, all that stuff. And we've got the betas so that we could actually predict the expected return on that stock or that portfolio. So, I mean, this is our output. Notice here that our market... Uh, factor is still 
it still certainly predicts our return on the semi semiconductor uh, ETF or fund. Uh, our T-STAT is well above 1.96, indicating statistical significance. P-value significantly lower than 0.05. Uh, and then some of these other factors, I guess they don't really add much significance here. Uh, really, the big driver of our regression results is the market factor. All right, so with that, I'm going to summarize. Uh, so in this video, we talked about market anomalies. I showed the results for some of them. Uh, market anomalies in involve stocks that when sorted based on one character will consistently either outperform or underperform the cap M. Basically, if we have a consistently positive or negative alpha when we run the cap M, we potentially have a market anomaly. There are a lot of problems with the cap M and these problems have led to the prevalence of APT models. And APT models, they indicate that there are additional risk factors like the value factor or the size factor that can predict uh, asset returns or stock returns. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you're curious about where I got all of the data uh, in from these uh, papers, here's just my references. Uh, but if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. And if not, I will see you in the next video. Thank you.